44. Starting December 11th, Fishing the DMV will be cutting back to only doing our Monday night live streams each week until we hit our first Patreon goal of 100 Patreon subscribers. We are only 44 subscribers away from, e from achieving that goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, you can help support the show. All Patreon supporters will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle each and every month. You'll also gain access to our private Facebook community, entered into weekly prize giveaways that'll be announced during Monday Night Live, access to members-only videos and live stream, and monthly prize giveaways, and just so much more. And we are only 44 subscribers away from achieving this first goal. And then we'll be back to multiple episodes per week. Check the episode description down below or click the link above my head. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today we are we are finally in December. And guys, this is going to be one of the last weeks that we're going with two to three episodes per week until we hit some of our quotas on the Patreon. And really, to give you a Christmas treat just before the holidays, I really wanted to have these brothers on here, you know, Cole and Chase Bennett, to talk about a place that was mentioned and rumored, which was Phil Potlake, the place that the DWR talked about is the place that was ground zero for the spot, the Alabama bass invasion. But I also wanted to delve into their history a little bit more and what got them into fishing in general. So really, without further ado, Chase, Colin, thank you so much for coming on tonight. I really appreciate it. Chase, appreciate Colin. it. <laughs> that, that's actually good. Yeah, point that out. But yeah. yeah thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Glad <laughs> to be here. So uh, fishing wise, uh, our dad was in a club back in the mid 2000s. Um, and we're 10 years apart. I'm 30. He just turned 21. So when I was got old enough to really start going for a full day of tournament fishing at 10, 11, 12 years old, dad would take me. Um, they had uh, a guest division, if you will. You weren't in the club, but it was like a side pot, co type deal. Um, he started taking me. One of the first um, places I remember going was Philpot. Um Primarily, when I was young, young, we went to a couple other small local lakes, Heiko Lake down in North Carolina, uh, Bugs here and there, Smith Mountain. Philpot was kind of an outlier. But uh, what really got us as a family into going up there was they bought a camper. When I was about 13 or 14, and props to the Corps of Engineers because there's a campground like every other mile on that lake um goose point campground uh horseshoe be horse bend horseshoe point. point yeah um salt house bowens creek did not a campground but it's a wreck area there's the, lots of wreck areas and, and campgrounds along the way and so when i got to the point of when i was 15 16 years old and could be on a boat alone while we were camping i was burning the water down fishing That's so um and just it, it's all right. We're about 35 minutes down the road. We live about uh, so Philpot is in Bassett, Virginia, former home of Bassett Furniture. Well, it still is, but uh, it's out of the boom era. Um, and the lake was actually built for flood control through the town of Bassett, um, and the industry that was growing up back in the 50s, 60s when it was built. But uh, it just became our kind of default place to go, and uh, still is, yeah, it still is. Um, <laughs> It's, you know, 35 minutes up the road. There's typically, you know, it's a, it's a natural lake. There are no, um, the Army Corps has a buffer around the whole water line, shoreline huh. of property ownership. So there are very, very few privately owned docks or properties on the lake and which ones are are floating. But they, I think they were, they were grandfathered in somehow. But I um, mean, it's a, it's a go ahead. I'm sorry. So, I was just say, say, so, so it's, it's not, not like Lake Norman or Lake Anne when it comes to docks that you're going to see. No, no. You, it, could, you could just about count on one hand how many docks are on the lake. There there might be 10. And, wow. Um, that's from the dam to where the river splits. Damn. And Damn. most of them are in one pocket for some reason. I don't know if that was property owned before. Uh, around this number six mile marker, there's a pocket that has six or eight floating docks in it. 
beyond that, there might be one just here and there, but it's it's primarily a it's a it's deep, clear, bluffy rock wood. Um, it's a different animal for somebody coming from bugs. <laughs> Put it that way. <laughs> it, it it really is, and and guys, again, like. You know, link in the episode description, everything we talk about, and I'll put up here, um, you know, in post-production kind of an image of the lake to kind of show you that it's about 2,800, 3,000 acres ish. Um, it, it's, it's Southwest of Smith mountain Lake to give you an idea. And I think because it's so close to Smith and Leesville Lake, it does get until the DWR talked about it. I was like, what the hell is this place? I didn't even know it existed, honestly. And so this is, all new to me and I'm learning about this place as well. And it seems like a great place to cut your teeth, which is what you guys really did growing up. What kind of style is that? Like, I'm assuming this is more of like a mountainous <laughs> clear lake. It, it, it's not like a swampy cypress, uh, like coastal kind of place, right? No, it's a, you go fishing with a drop shot in your hand and spend eight hours to get eight keeper bites. And all of them could be 30 foot deep or deeper. Wow. Yeah. On that last turn, we, so tournament fishing wise, most of what we do up there, it's, it's kind of just wildcat style. Um, we've got a Facebook group. Uh, what's it called? Open field pot, like open tournament, something yeah. of that nature. Um, a couple of local guys, um, organized it, started doing it about three years ago, I guess. Maybe. Just little forty dollars Sunday tournaments. Um, you might have, you know, your clubs and some Bass Nation stuff going on there. Um, There's really fundraiser no type things. Tournaments, but, yeah. And pro the pro most of the problem there is just facilities. Even if you wanted to have fifty or seventy five boats, there's not really anywhere to accommodate that field. So, mm. anglers did one back in I think two thousand nine or ten. I fished. And it was like seventy five boats, and that place was rocking. Really, there was there was nowhere to fish. <laughs> it was <laughs> like so, in a perfect world. What would be the perfect amount? Perfect thirty thirty comfortably fifty. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Fifty at the most. Yeah. Very very most fifty boats. And the reason being is a lot of your cuts and creeks and coves and things, they're so narrow where it's in the foothills of the mountain. You know, it's not like you can pull in the pocket and go down the other side because you're going to be gunnel to gunnel with that boat by the time you get halfway back. Mm, okay. So, yeah, it just gets really narrow really quick. And that's just because of the way the lay of the land, the way the, the lake, uh, the way it feels, you know. Yes. But it is, it's a. Uh, it's uh you know winter time you can get away with a little more power fishing and not necessarily you know square bill or spinner bait but you know uh, jerk bait a rig type stuff but after that it's um it gets you gotta be you gotta have some skinny line and small stuff and we're learning now um if you're not looking at them you wasting time pretty much with four facing I was going to say like forward facing sonar. What it has done is, is insane. And then guys, just for the people that are watching on YouTube, uh, here you go. Here's just a little like view of the lake here. It's, it's very, um, it really reminds me of like the Arkansas, uh, white river style of lakes, very stringy with a ton of freaking fingers and all that on there. So I feel like all 2000 acre lakes, small lakes don't fish the same. An example is I got to in college fish Indian reservoir in, um, Ohio, which is literally a fishbowl at 2,000, 3,000 acres. And that shit, you get on top of each other real quick. This place is 2,000 acres, but it's a shit ton of nooks and crannies on this place. Yeah, like, and, and something interesting, there's, you might have figured this out, there's no contour maps, there's no Navionics or Lake Master. No. <laughs> shows it. <laughs> Well, if it was, they would all be that close together and it would be because yeah, <laughs> so, it's so it, deep. It looked about like it does now. <clears throat> yeah. And that's what's insane about this place. It's kind of cool uh, just because I enjoy like exploring is like, and guys, if you go like to train on Google Maps, which I kind of like the train feature kind of shows you this, it's steep. It's really steep. Uh, all these areas here. Um, I don't know. It's a cool freaking place. Um, 
I can tell just by the topography here, you do learn how to fish deep really effectively. How has fishing deep and then the advancement of forward facing sonar, how has that helped you in your learning curve with this place? I probably bought forward facing a little over a year ago. On Phil Pot, I'd been fishing deep. You know, you what, fishing fishing shallow on Phil Pot what 20 you, foot. Yeah. What you thought was deep. <laughs> so I'm already fishing, you know, 20 foot. If I'm if I can see the bottom at all, I'm not comfortable. <laughs> um oh, crap. Yeah. And well, I think forward it, facing just kind of it opened up a lot of opportunity that we never knew was there. Mm, because yeah. while we were fishing here, the fish were back there. Yeah, I mean, that's like I'd pull up to a grass bed that I'd been fishing for, you know, two or three years in a row and had been catching fish out of in, in the late summer or whatever. And uh, now, I mean, it's like you pan over a couple, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet. And there's this nice brush pile where there's this nice standing tree because that's another thing. Phil Pot's got standing timber that they'll get in too. The walleye guys love that. Yeah. But um, it's opened up a lot for sure. I think that's the thing that's... It, forward facing sonar gets a bad rap online to where like you're just going to watch every fish eat the damn bait. And to me, it's the how quickly you can be like, I shouldn't be here. And this is my first year running it, believe it or not. And that was the fastest thing of like, I shouldn't throw this bait. I got to leave this cove. And if you have half a brain as a fisherman, you're going to get better because you eliminate water so freaking fast with that shit. You really do. Well, that's like, you know, he and I, we've been fishing tournaments together since I think I took him to his, I, I think his seventh first. Seventh grade, 13. Yeah. 13. He caught a seven pounder on a Carolina rig and thought he was hung, by the way. <laughs> oh, my, <laughs> First tournament, first tournament I'd ever <laughs> not not at Phil Pot at a high school like down the road, but uh, anyhow, we you know he's done the high school and a little bit of college thing. I didn't have that opportunity. You got into the tail or I guess the beginnings of it. Yeah. Um. But you know, our we've been fishing together as a team for almost a decade, ten years now. <laughs> you know, and we've developed a style so. You know, with my work schedule that I worked for a while, I was I had a lot of weekends. Um, but now that I'm free on the weekends, and especially with forward facing coming out, we've had to kind of change our strategy approach, approach um, fishing as a team because just the yeah, I mean the the, the doors it's opened. Um, and we, we for example, we pulled up on a we we figured them out a little too late a couple of weeks ago and started we didn't really start catching fish until lunchtime we had 20 minutes left pulled up on a point and was seeing activity in 45 to 50 feet of water wow. and caught three down and that had deep. three cut and had three keepers in a in a spell of he was trying to call and i was swinging him in because i didn't have a net man <laughs> like it's but just that like i said being able to pull up on a spot shine around and see the life or lack thereof is uh, it makes you so much more efficient. Well, and I feel like that's a big thing about Phil Pot too is those fish will just roam. They're, I mean, that, they're really pelagic. pelagic. Yeah. So you don't really have to have some type of cover on a spot to catch fish. So forward facing allows you instead of just fan casting across a red clay point to just troll across it until you see a little blip on your screen and then throwing at it. Yeah. They'll they'll hold on anything. If it's a bare stretch or a flat point or, or you know, if there's a rock that big, it'll be efficient on it. So when when you say pelagic or pelagic, I'm sorry, what is I mean we can really get into the fill pop biology here. What is the primary bait fish that makes them roam? I think it's just thread fin. Thread fin. Yeah. That's interesting. That, yeah, I, I've never, say. I've never in all of my time there, and I'm sure you have it. You know, Smith, you'll see uh, school of gizzards, you know, eight, ten inch gizzards swimming around all the time. 
I've never seen it. I don't think they're in there. There may be some L life in there just because of the, it, it is a good environment for them. But uh, three to four inch thread thin probably is a predominant. And they look crawfish. Because, yeah, I know on Smith, they're having an issue with blueback herring. And blueback herring are starting to get more and more in population there, which kind of makes sense down at the dam area. And and we got to kind of like, before we get into the big hot button issue with Philpot, like what is the cover situation before we talk about the bass situation there? Like, is it primarily extending timber? I think you guys said aquatic vegetation is in there as well. Lay downs, hydrilla, brush, rock, whatever you need, they got except docks. That's yeah, um, a paradise. There's, uh, really, there's a lot of... Uh, I, we talk like it's so deep and clear everywhere. It's really, there's a lot of flat clay yeah. or sandy type stuff on the lower end, uh, say from about uh, the Goose Point campground, which is about two miles to the dam. Um, and around the islands, Deer and Turkey Island are the two biggest. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you can go from dragging a 15, 20 foot. You know, well, at its before it drops, but it's a long slope, round point. You can go from that to across the lake, a bluff wall where it drops up into 80 feet. Damn. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of good chunk <laughs> rock. Like I said, lay downs everywhere, especially where there's more pines, but I don't really like pines because they have pine cones and I get my shit hung up in them. <laughs> um, yeah. And then the lower end, yeah, hydrilla is pretty, it's starting to take hold pretty good especially around the same island areas and i want to say the army corps is growing it because... yeah they've got the like the fenced off little areas hmm. in yeah. a couple of places i think they're planting it but it's, it seems to be doing good I, it was the healthiest this year towards september i've seen it in several years so and that's interesting because this kind of leads into the big hot button debate with biologists how is the largemouth fishery there with and this will, we have to talk about this when we talk about Philpot, the Alabama bass situation that's in there. <laughs> From fishing the lake since for 15 plus years now, there are more big largemouth in that lake now than there were before. However, I put it this way. My old uh, Bass Nation partner and I, we went a regional there in September of oh. They got to find a trophy. <laughs> I think it was two, it was oh nine or two thousand ten. We won it in September with three fish for six pounds. Damn. Twenty boats. Twenty boats. Wow. There was nothing abnormal about the weather. It was just September. You know, it's that funk. And I mean, of course, a lot of there are a lot more aids now. Ford facing, smaller line, all that good stuff. But I mean, it's pumping out. Come January, February into March, you'll start seeing, you should start seeing 17 to 20 pound bags pretty it, regular. It took like 17 change to win this past weekend. And that'll, that, and that could be with a three or four pound spot. He called one four and a half pound spot a couple of early, late October. Yeah. And, and, and this is why I, I, that one of the, reasons I wanted to have you guys on is to have not a biologist's opinion, but a local that lives there and deals with it. How, like, what do you think about the whole situation with that? With the they get in the way. Hmm. They get in the way when you start uh, that one, you and daddy won. Mm -hmm. uh, they had 14 something. It was when it was or late October. Mm -hmm. I was on one of our pretty reliable places and was seeing fish and then, you know, pretty much called the shot on light or on, uh, what's daddy got? Mega live. Mega live. Yeah. And it was an eight inch spot. You know, I couldn't get anything on the lower end. I went up the river all the way pretty much far as you can go before it flattens out and was started flipping some wood because I was seeing a lot of bait, but it wasn't any fish on. So I was flipping some wood. I mean, I don't flip a jig much of anywhere, much less a fill pot, but just I was kind of spinning out, mm. catching eight and ten inch spots, flipping a jig in log jams. Like they're everywhere and they get in the way. But you got to weed through them. I don't think yeah. they've affected the population of the largemouth or the size of the largemouth. 
you just catch more fish now. Yeah. Huh. That's a good way to put it. You catch yeah. you catch more fish that you have to deal with untangling your drop shot and throwing back. It's kind of a waste of time. You know, it's a cookie cutter spot. Um, but they do taste good. I will say good that. Bonus. Good bonus. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's interesting. Uh, one, one episode I haven't dropped yet was with a guy that runs, I think it's Auburn University. And he talks about that where if you have a lot of grass and a lot of shallow cover, the largemouth bass population will be okay because spots don't like that stuff, generally speaking. So you'll have largemouth. The problem is when it's super clear and super deep and there's not a lot of cover, the spots or Alabama bass just freaking take over like a Lake Hartwell necessarily or a Lanier. Um, I don't know. It's just such an interesting like topic or, or a Norman, but Norman seems to be bouncing back with largemouth right now from where it was at. But it sounds like from what you guys said with the hydrilla that they have there, like they're fine. The largemouth are still there. You they, know, it's they it's, live in the grass too. Yeah. When it's growing in the summertime, yeah. they live in it. it. It's funny that you mentioned that. The uh the spotted bass have been in there probably five years now. The hydrilla has been in there probably five years now. Interesting. It has, it had it had grass before. Um 2011-ish. It would top out in 20 foot of water. Huh. The grass would. It's not back there yet, but I I see it going that direction. Yeah. That is so interesting to me because what was said, and guys, don't worry, this episode will be dropped here soon when I finish cleaning it up. Alabama bass and spots hate grass. That's why they haven't taken over Florida lakes is because they can't handle that. I don't think I've caught a single spotted bass out of grass. Yeah, we Which- fish not. Yeah. When night tournaments will fish, they do Tuesday from 7 to 11 mm-hmm. and Friday from 7 to 1. We, a lot of grass fishing gets done, and we don't catch spots. And this also leads into something else, which is a side note, which is why I think the Army Corps of Engineers need at Lake Kerr, at Bugs, need to allow hydrilla to grow. Absolutely. I, that will neutralize the, the Alabama bass spotted bass issue. Boom. And I'm telling you, man. I, I, hadn't, <laughs> been, I hadn't been to Kerr, or but we call it Bugs. Bugs. I, I hadn't been there this year at all. Have you? I went back in October, and then I I, come, I did good in the ABAs back yeah. in August. But like everybody's talking about the shoreline grass growing down there. That's that's great and all, but what they really need for those pelagic spots or to give the largemouth somewhere to go besides three foot of water mm-hmm. is that hydrilla. I agree. And, you know, a big thing about bugs too. Those largemouth are scared to go up to too shallow because. Water might change so quick. Next day, it's going to be dirt where they was living at. So it, I don't know. I don't get no, above. But that's a great, because guess what? If you want to fish competitively in fishing, it sucks, but you have to go to Kerr. Like every regional, every freaking big tournament goes to <laughs> Kerr. Yeah. I, don't, I don't like it. I think other lakes should get a nod. I mean, hell, Lake Anna's dropping 32 pound bags every other weekend right now, but that place will never get looked. But the point is you have there's to go- room, there's room there too. That's the thing about it. Yeah. There's plenty of room. I don't know why, you know, I, I agree. I don't like, I don't care if it's, it doesn't have to be like Anna for my listeners. If Gaston was pumping out 30 pound bags every weekend, I'd be like, that's where the regional should be held. Cause that would be, that's the best lake should hold it. It's a healthy fishery. Exactly. Exactly. And, and since you guys have dealt with the Alabama bass, Compare and contrast real quick, just for clarification to the audience, the difference between Bugs Island and the Alabama bass issue and then Philpot, because it sounds like Philpot doesn't have the same issues Kerr or Bugs Island does. Bugs. I'll be back. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, he didn't got mad. Got to go downstairs. And- <laughs> yeah. No. Um, you know, Bugs, I... I fished a lot there over the summer this year. It was some uh, some ABAs down there. And I don't know if you know this, but several years ago, there was a uh, the LMBV virus yeah. hit bugs. And those fish are still sickly looking. I mean, them things are skinny as can be. It's It's really hard to catch a healthy looking bass at bugs. Spotted bass look pretty healthy down there. I mean, they they got a nice gut on them. Bugs Island has seems to me like I just I catch so many skinny bass. You know, I'll catch a fourteen inch keeper that weighs 
one one pound point one five, not even fifteen ounces, a tenth of a pound. You know, whereas at Phil Pot, you'll catch a fourteen incher and he'll be a pound pound and a half, pound three quarter. That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I caught one today that was. He won but 14 inches, and I think I weighed him on a scale. He was almost a pound and a half. They're healthy. Yeah. I mean, they're footballs at Phil Pot. Is, is, that, it, is that just virus, or you think it's also forage? I think it's forage, too. I mean, Bugs is – Bugs does not have hydrilla, and the largemouth have a whole lot more real estate to cover to find bait fish. I feel like – the population of bait and fish and compete with spots. Yeah, I feel like the population of bait fish and bugs per, I don't know, acre, square mile, whatever. I feel like it's a lot less bait fish per X amount of square water. <laughs> to, to, to today, Junior. <laughs> yeah, compared to field pod. <laughs> this is true. I mean, like, I, I heard Charlie Taylor, who's an old salt, uh, like an old fisherman around here. Um, it said like Lake Anna can fit in Kerr like six or seven times. Like it's insane how big that place is. And it, it's just, it's so much real estate to cover to find the bait and the, and the fish populations. I mean, there's going to be, there's always going to be your classic grassy Creek is going to be a mainstay. Nut bush is its own lake. Pretty them much. Fish are always, them fish are always shallow at bugs, though. For anybody listening, there's never offshore fish at bugs. <laughs> never at all. <laughs> but you know, roads and butchers is its its own lake. You know, you know, or panhandle. We'll put that in with it. Um, I really like. We're supposed to be talking about field pot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Stay out of nut bush. Ain't no fish oh, yeah. in nut. Yeah, we'll we'll get back to Philpot, believe that. But yeah, it's so interesting because you got you got three big lakes, I think, that have the Alabama bass or spotted bass issue, which is Philpot, Kerr, Bugs, and Gaston. All three of them are dealing with it completely different, which is interesting. Where it sounds like Kerr or Bugs has done the absolute worst. It sucks. And then you have Gaston, which is kind of mid. You can still catch them decently there. But then Phil Pot sounds like it's the unicorn where like you can still catch a twenty plus pound bag easily. With uh, all three species. Yeah. And, it's like, yeah. and it sounds like it's because of the hydrilla and all the cover in the bait. Cause I know Gaston got a shit ton of spraying done a couple of years ago to try and get rid of the vegetation, which sucks. Cause when I was a kid, there was a ton of grass in Gaston. Um Yeah, I remember that. Shoreline yeah. grass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there was a ton That's of it. Probably tight stuff. And you could go down there for ABAs and things like that, and you could catch them throwing with a swim jig and stuff. And now it's like it it fishes more like a Carolina Hartwell type of situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Phil Pot has the perfect balance of offshore grass and bait fish to where the largemouth are able to combat the rise of populations of spotted bass. Yeah, it's a healthy fisherman. Mm -hmm. Until somebody proves me otherwise, that, that's our opinion. And then just to throw people that maybe want to like vacation there and, and fish fill pot, what is the fishing like in the winter time there? Is it, are you targeting large mouth? Are you looking still like for the spotted bass and Alabama bass who based on history, they do bite better in the winter time, generally speaking. Winter time's the toughest for me at fill pot. Um, yeah. I mean, I'd say, I'd just say target fish. Hmm. Bait. Bait's the, like, the, the main deal. Bait. And target individual fish that you see on your screen or that. and individual bait balls that you see. But uh, largemouth, smallmouth, you're going to catch them in the same bunch a lot of times. Um, the spots, who knows where they might be. I, I really, we don't target spots. If we catch one, fine. But I would say we target, with an exception of about a very special two to three weeks in the year, we talk with large mouths for the most part. And if a big smolly comes on over the side, then that's just a plus. With, without giving away the time of year, why is that two-week period a difference? <laughs> we got to give away the time of year, right? Um, <laughs> no, yeah. no. Like, like, so, like, but that's because the spots are better to target, basically? No, no, smallmouth. Oh, the smallmouth. The smallmouth. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, smallmouth are a lot more predictable. Well, then about it. A, I mean, it, it, it's no secret. April, May, spawn time. Um, we 
I, honestly, an old timer clued our dad into a, a little trick, mm-hmm. and we've expanded on that. And I'm talking about with high vis yellow six pound line on an old fiberglass spin pole. And that dude was catching 16, 17 S- smallmouth bags. Slayed them. <laughs> so we just kind of took the the area he 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 you know showed dad and the type of things to look for and kind of tailored it to our own uh, style, if you will. And that's something I wanted to segue into because I've had every DWR agent on, on the planet to say like Alabama bass will kill off a smallmouth bass population because they interbreed and turn them into mules. And eventually based on what they said, you won't have smallmouth left because they'll interbreed with them. Is there a healthy smallmouth population still in the lake? We, yeah, we. I mean, man, you caught a last one. We last tournament we fished, we had one at four, and then before that, you and Dad had two of them, didn't you? Was it? Oh, that was a spot. Man, you had two, but we throw one back because he was yeah, caught so deep. He was caught so deep, he was gonna die pretty much. Fizz, like, but uh, yeah, yeah I mean, until I it, it, it's not like so. Years back, and this is before your time, but people would go up in the dead of summer, July, August. July, August at at daylight and the smallmouth would be schooling just in the middle of the lake, over a hundred feet of water. Damn. Breaking. And so you'd see guys crank up and then shut down and coast up to the, the fish. But they, they were they were that into that bait. You throw any kind of floating, you could throw a floating hot dog over there. You get smallmouth. Texas rig being sausage. <laughs> Texas rig being a sausage. <laughs> But they, I don't see them doing that like they used to. And I'm going to venture to say that's because of the spots and the pelagic nature of them. So I think the smallmouth have changed. A lot of them, I think, are more into the crawdad deal. Mm. Now. I don't know how much of that has to do with the spotted bass and how much of it has to do with live school. That too, yeah. That's a good point. That's a damn good point there. Cause I know on Smith there and ever I see it too up here on the upper Potomac where I fish, you shine that freaking cancer ray on them and they turn real quick. Yeah. Well, they, they feel the beam and that's something folks don't, don't think about. Like yeah. sonar is a sound. It's a vibration going through the water. So if Chase is sitting 30 foot deep and he feels, mm-hmm. he's going to move. You know, if he feels that tapping on the shoulder, he's going to move. And I think it's like deer hunting too. The smaller bucks are, reti- are, are stupid. They they don't, they, they're done with the same pressure or experience. Exactly. But <laughs> when they get to be three or four pounds or eight points, 10 points, they've been around. And so they feel that tick, tick, tick. I'm turning and I'm leaving. They get it. Yeah, he's got a, that's something. And he's a, a way ahead of the curve, way more ahead of the curve than I am with the forward facing. But I'm starting to come around, and uh, I'm seeing when you when you see that speck, you better make make it look better. Make a good first cast because after that, probably not going to have another shot. I 100% agree with that. I really freaking do. I I have a brother, and I, I know fishing. I'm sorry. With brother, yeah, I know, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. What is that like having him as a partner? Then, like for people at home. Is it, it's weird because it's like other, I, I know how many sad stories about breaking up with your partner, but it's family and you still got to go to Thanksgiving together. So how has that worked over the years? Oh, it sucks, man. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we butt heads, we butt heads. Um, but I, I, honestly, I think because of our age difference, we get along better. Something else I feel like too. If you're fishing with a guy that you don't know that good, that you're not as comfortable around, you're going to be scared to tell him, like, look, I don't think we should be doing this. I feel like this is the wrong decision. Let's do this. Whereas communications, we communicate very well. Yeah. And when it comes to just, you know, turning left when we've been going right, zigging instead of zagging. And we, we constantly bounce – we do, and we, yeah, we, yeah. We, we bounce off one another all the time. If it ain't working, we say, well, maybe let's – he's got his youthful experience, and I've got my 
I'm gonna be honest. I'd rather be flip. I'd rather be throwing a brush hog on on the bank. It's just yeah. It's in my I've got my let's go sit out eighty foot deep and snipe individual I, fish I, I, up I, forty I, foot suspended <laughs> and Chase says, "What the hell with that? Let's go in a creek somewhere and flip a jig on stumps up shallow." And just sometimes <laughs> it pays off. I mean, I yeah. just it. It's, yeah, it it's a good balance, I think, uh, when it comes to fishing as a team and having different backgrounds and different styles. But I'm I'm coming around to the old fairy wand. I, and I think I think the fairy wand is that stock is only going up as more and more pressure. Well, comes. That's like when the shaky head exploded was when I was 15, 16 years old. You were 20 ish, probably it's about right. When the shaky head got big, and then you know, it was a shaky head, then it was a drop shot. Yep. I'll be honest, he does his thing. I just flip around the Senko half the time and see what happens. But the, <laughs> shaky, the shaky head is like the new jig. Like, I don't know how many times on the Tidal Potomac spoiler alert, like how much money that sucker's won on Tidal Fisheries. You don't pitch a jig anymore because you know everyone in their brother have done that already. You you go straight to pitching a shaky head and the finesse style presentation, but also like when it comes to a team, and I think this is interesting. I know a lot of old school teams that if somebody's fishing a shaky head, the other dude's going to fish a shaky head too. Do you guys fish the same bait in the front of the boat or do you guys mix it up to see what's going to work? Until we've got it dialed, we never throw the same thing. Interesting. I mean, it still it might still be a plastic, but just a different presentation. But not the exact same thing. I'm I'm a rig dragger. <laughs> That's just what I I grew up on, and it's like Alcoholics Anonymous. It's like I'm a rig. Yeah, dragger. I mean, I'm a, I'm a rig dragger. So <laughs> he does his little thing up front, and I'll just drag a speed crawl around and uh, a ball and chain. Yeah, I mean, he, he gets he gets irritated with me sometimes. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that we you know if, if uh, you know, top water's playing. One of us might throw a little real shallow jerk bait. I think that's what you got to do. I feel like everyone, when I've had partners, they get so weird to me. It's like, and this is because I had a brother and we fished tournaments together. It's like, well, hey, the drop shots work. Why don't you throw the drop shots? Like, great. I want to see if anything else is working. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're on a team together and your fish count. I'm, I'm usually the experimental guinea pig. Yeah. And it, it ain't even so much like figuring out what's working. It can come down to top water and a shallow jerk bait. Well, that individual two and a half pounder didn't feel like blowing up on my mag sexy dog, so he wants to bite a little jerk plug instead. Yep. You know it. I don't know. It's one of those things. I mean, we'll we'll still match the speed of each other if that makes sense. I mean, if I'm hey, throwing pace. a crankbait, he'll pace. throw yeah. If I'm throwing a crank, he'll throw a spinner bait, but we rarely throw the same thing. Right. I, I think this is important because with forward facing sonar and you're fishing a co angler tournament, it doesn't matter. But when it's a group, are you guys both sniping the same fish or, or, you know, Colin, are you up at the front of the boat and then you put him in the back yeah, and say, like, like, you, you drag, drag while I actually, actually snipe. snipe? Like, how does that set him up as good as I can? It depends. <laughs> I mean, if, it, if, we get, if we're around enough fish, yeah. He'll throw a drop shot at him. I'll throw a net rig at him. Oh. And, you know, that's something about field pot too. Like, you can be sitting on a bluff and you can be 30 foot off the bank sitting in 80 foot of water. So Jeez. he's got the bank to throw at. I'm just looking for individuals that are, you know, the bottom of the bank is sitting like it right there and the fish will be. That, that's primarily, right that's primarily what we do. He stays on, on, the, on the forward facing. And I cover everything else I can do. Yeah. I, every, everything else I can. He'll throw it to lay downs, the rocks, mm -hmm. whatever, which there's, you know, still fish on. And I'll go after the randoms. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it typically, uh, good strategy. Really good strategy, honestly. Cause it's about catching 20 pounds. And if one of you is just swinging for the fence all day, like that's kind of what you got to do. Yeah. He's Have a. You Go ahead, oh, go, go, no, no, go for it. Go for it. I don't even. I didn't even have anything important to say. Um, I mean, if time and money allowed, have you guys thought about fishing like a higher, like a bigger tournament team series? I don't have the time off to. 
Yeah, I don't. So I just started a new career, like clean slate. Um, and yeah, I'm at I'm at my early midlife <laughs> crisis, I guess you could say. So I'm in the same boat. I kind of got re kind of restarted with you know vacation, and I took a pay cut because I was so miserable where I was. I used to fish uh, the anglers, um, pretty. English consistently. Choice team tournament. Yeah, English Choice Team Tournaments. Uh, last couple of years, we've kind of bounced around the BFL a little bit. I just, as a coach, just to get back out there. Because I, there for a while, I really didn't fish yeah. competitively um, just because of my work. My my golden years, when I was 16, 17, 18 years old, and my best friend, my fishing partner, Grandpa, owned a business and sponsored us. And it was just easy. Well, you know, growing up in school in my younger years, I didn't party. We had to be at the lake at four o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, life happens. And yeah, but I got back into it the best I could the last few years. And I was, uh, I was still working part time while I was in college. I'm still in college, but I'm working full time now. Bethel so, University. Uh, yeah. Represent. Yeah, Bethel, yeah, didn't work not for long. It didn't work no, out no, too well. great, but. <laughs> but yeah, I, I fished a full division of BFLs last year and year before last, too. That's when yeah, I fished, right? In yeah, 2021, yeah. And I, I fished at Piedmont in 22 and I came like 19th or 20th in points. I don't know, but um, did you get to fish at Bethel? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, he was on the team, okay, so. We're going to get, in, if you want to, I want to get into like a big overarching fishing industry thing that I got in a, a shouting match with a friend. No, we'll not tell you. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Is, but. Don't, don't, yeah. don't even make it, don't even make, make it edit that out. I got, and that's why everyone can think now and pontificate. Um, that's my buddy too. <laughs> I, I got to fish the Potomac team series growing up and I sucked. And I, it was really hard because I was. As a, as a guy in middle school and high school, me and my brother fished, and we thought we sucked because we were going up against guys that had 40 years of experience on, on the title Potomac. I go fish college against college guys, and I realize, like, oh, I'm not trash. I can, like, hold my own against my peers. And that really, re like, really kind of put in perspective. It's like, well, it's, it's years of experience. And what I'm going with this is with the BFLs where you can have a professional guy that has 200 years of experience and he's sponsored to the hilt and he can come in. Should that be allowed or should there be a brand new league? That's just for grassroots guys that can only fish weekends because you got to experience college where guess what? A pro can't come in and snipe. It's just guys, your peers go out there and compete. What are your thoughts on all that? Because you got to experience all of it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know the college <laughs> deal. I didn't. I fished like three tournaments in for Bethel, and then I was done. Um, it was fun while it lasted, you know. I I would say the only tournaments I fished were on TVA lakes, and them college boys was some TVA hammers. It kind of felt like I was fishing the darn BPT out there. Uh, as far as BFLs goes. <laughs> I think BPT joke. I'm sorry. It's inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> we're uh we're not defaming major league fishing, but we're <laughs> definitely Bassmaster fans. <laughs> um no, I mean I, I feel like me personally, <coughs> eventually I want to be able to fish for a living. If I'm gonna fish for a living, I gotta treat it like it's my job. So I'm okay with fishing against dudes that fish for a living. I'm okay with it. It's up. I ain't fishing against them. I'm just trying to catch the most weight I can. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Master is not listening to this, by the way, so you can relax. Um. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's an interesting debate because, to me, I and mean, everyone knows my my thought on that. There needs to be a league where it's just for grassroots that you can't snipe it, just to give those guys a chance. I'm on that side. I'm not. I'm not. You know. I, if I fished a BFL as a boater, I don't think so. But if I did, and pro John Smith shows up with unlimited, well, compared to the rest of the field or the majority of the rest of the field, 
resources to a T. I don't really like that. Well, you see, what gets me is like there's these guys, and I mean, it's nothing against them, you know, good for you. But there's guys out there that own their own business and have unlimited vacation supply and unlimited income. They have the same resources that a guy that does it for a living has. They're yeah. just not fish. They just didn't qualify for the tour or the invitationals or the elite series. They still have the resources. They just don't have the label that they fish for. So I don't really see where being a pro really makes much difference. Nah, he's got a point there too. T to me, it's the fact that if I could afford to fish the Bass Opens or the Toyota Series, I would. And therefore, I would then compete against the professionals, the higher stakes guys. And the reason I don't is because we can't afford it. And that's where it's a little weird to me. It's like, why are we just fishing the BFLs? Because it's the only thing we have time or money to deal with. And I don't feel like I should have to compete against those pros because I literally, if I, if I could do it, I would. And there's a next level for that. There's even, a double A. Even now, you know, BFL, $200 is not the same $200 it used to be. Exactly. It's, it's not. 300, 400 now, whatever it is for a BFL. I don't know the door. I don't know. I ain't fished. Last I knew it was 200 bucks. Yeah. But, God, he, dude. Oh, yeah. but, even, but like I said, that's what I meant. $200, $300, $400. None of, no, no amount of money is the same thing as it was five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, preach that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's a, that that is a that is a legit thing to to yeah. consider. I mean, there is tournaments for there. I don't want to say below because that sounds kind of rude, but there are tournaments like grass below race. the it's like grass race. Yeah, you know, like there's the nation, the Bass Nation. There's club tournaments. There's like what I just fished today, just little bootleg coffee can tournaments. There's stuff out there that's not as high stakes is BFLs too, you know, and, yeah. and maybe that's, yeah, there's a, yeah. got a point there. Yeah. I, I think the biggest thing that pissed me off with the VFL change when MLF bought it was the, you can buy your way into the regional. That really pissed me off to where if you pay for like all three tournaments on the Shenandoah division, you can get into the regional. It's like yeah. in any other sport, that's a thing that you earn based on how well you did. You can't, buy your way into it and i just it rubs me wrong as a competitor like that's, that's how, how you, you can yeah your way in so to speak i don't the know when and you're in or yeah pay and play whatever it is I, yeah i remember yeah. seeing that in the rules i know what you're talking about yeah i don't like that either yeah it's like i remember like the one year i fished really good and it put time in it's like this guy didn't fish two other events but he got to go because he paid for him either way and it's like that's bullshit but i don't know it's just it, things that i wish i could change and college fishing opened my eyes to it when hey you got to be a college person and you get to fish and it's all your peers and it definitely changes the dynamic a little bit when you see who actually is kind of good when it's just all your peers and you can go from there well the thing about the bfls too is it, it, its purpose is to be a grassroots type thing right mm -hmm. and you also got guys that just because they have a youtube channel think they're a pro I, I don't even. I don't even need to get into it. But. No, no, go for it. Go for it. We can always edit no, it. There, there's there are individuals um, that, like I said, just because they have a YouTube channel and not knocking them. I mean, he's, they will do well at times, but by and large, will suck a lot of the other times. It, but they get that mentality: if I'm a pro fisherman because I'm fishing a division of BFLs, mm -hmm. and they get out there and then they back boats screw their co all day because they think they're a pro it's just uh, it's, it's it's annoying that's a great conversation because that's a, that's a whole other show <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other show i once so i picked up a co-angler who weighed about 700 pounds and he jumped on the and he jumped on the back of my boat and he broke two of my box lids. Um, it bless his heart. I'm glad he could walk still. But the point was, it did damage the boat. And then I had another guy that spilled like spike it dye on, on my carpet. And I thought to myself, if I could pay a little extra not to have a co, I actually I might do that. Yeah, and because I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of boaters out there. They don't want a co. 
but I it's and I get, gonna, it. I get it. I get it. You know, what they're I mean? not. Yeah, I mean, they're not going to come out and say that. Like, I don't want you in my boat, but you can you can get the vibe when somebody's like, I'd just really rather you not be here. And now ABA this year, that's what they're doing. Yeah, they're awesome. yeah. Yes, sir. I'm ready for the pro league. And if I could pick between the BFLs and the pro league, that's what I would do. I would yeah. actually use the pro league for the, uh, the BFLs. Period. This is my deal. I think if they made it happy. The so, sorry, I'm happy to have a co angler and I'm he paid his entry just like I did. I fished as a co angler before. I know how it is. If all I can get on is a live scope bite. I'm going to feel really bad. <laughs> I'm going to just feel really bad. I think three fish limit would solve a lot of problems. Yeah. I agree with that 100%. But I think there's this weird shame to where, like, if you want to be a co-angler, I get it. But if a boater wants to pay extra not to have a co-angler, it's his right to do that, too. Yeah, that, yeah. Let it be an option. Yeah. And I think how much drama would that cure? And I think what's scary, and this is why it hasn't happened yet, is I think there'd be a lot more people that haven't admitted it in public, that would pay that little extra to not have a co-angler, to not deal with that crap. Oh, I, I, I ain't ashamed, man. No shame. I'd pay it. <laughs> Same here. Same yes. here. I mean, 50 bucks. Not huh? even. 100, and, $50, $100 I mean, to, to be able to go do your own thing all day. And for me, it's not having to deal with somebody in the back of the boat. Oh, it's, it's me not having to worry about making sure that the guy in the back of the boat catches fish. Mm-hmm. Or give at least give them the best opportunity and give them an opportunity, a fair opportunity. If I don't have somebody in the back, I don't have to worry about setting them up. I guess is what I should say. Yeah, it, it's the awkwardness. It's almost like if you could go to a car dealership and look at vehicles without a sales rep staring at you the whole time. It's the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you don't want to be rude, but if I could pay not to have you here while I look around, it's like I would rather do that. And it's the same thing with a co-angler. I don't hate you, but if I didn't have to have you, it's not as weird. I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, we, when we both done the coat thing, like it's a and the ma overwhelming majority of guys out there. Are fantastic. Oh, 100%. Both, both. Overwhelming majority. But I feel like that small percentage just kind of ruins the appeal for people look, maybe looking into getting into fishing mm -hmm. as a co. I feel like that small percentage could be a deterrent, you know? So, yeah, having, uh, you know, a, a pay to play type thing to fish alone would, I think, would solve a lot of problems. I really think it would. It would probably encourage. More, I mean, th the fishing industry's through the roof right now, but I, I feel like it would encourage people to to take that leap and start fishing as a co and get into the sport, knowing that you're going to be on a boat with somebody that wants you there. I really do. I, I think it would. I think I just want to see it'd be interesting, you know, as a content creator myself, too. Sometimes I'd rather not have a co and I could set up a camera and I could just go fishing and I wouldn't have to worry about him. I could snipe and not deal with like, Hey, I have to, I have to go into this dock. It sucks. I'm gonna have to backboat you, but I, I need to do this. And it, it, yeah, I don't know. I would, I would pay the money. Um, and you mentioned something else, which is worth talking about with, with the YouTube crowd and stuff. It, it's interesting how that has evolved where, yeah, they're a part of this industry now. They really are. And it's interesting to see how that kind of grows. And, you know, you kind of mentioned that earlier. Did you want to elaborate on that anymore? No, just... Uh, <laughs> no, it's just... Uh, I think there needs... There needs to be an understanding just because you're producing content doesn't make you a professional. That's a great conversation. What is... What's your thought on what a professional is? There's, there's a what my brother's trying to say. <laughs> it's a lawyer. <laughs> is, my client. Is that there's, there's a difference between somebody who fishes for a living and does YouTube and a guy who does YouTube and fishes. If that makes sense. I think it does. I think. That's a good spin. Yeah. You're not the only ones to think this. Like, it's like it's not like you're breaking ground with this con, like this thought. No, no. We're just uh, two podunk country boys from yeah. South Central Virginia. <laughs> I think the thing is, YouTube is the new TV, and so, uh, what's a Milliken? Fine, uh, Milliken is a terrible example. Um, I don't know an example. Yeah, because he can actually fish too. Yeah, gave him some jigs. Love the guy. Uh, Bill Dance is, I think, on the other end of the spectrum. He's a TV guy. 
but if he would fish tournaments, what would your thought? Like, you know what I mean? Like he is the old school, he's a TV guy that's helped fishing, but he doesn't fish tournaments. And I think YouTube the same way. Yeah. YouTube's yeah. a new TV. You could be a TV host. Like a Mark Zona, but you fishing tournaments, that's kind of not the same thing. The interesting thing that I don't have the answer for is Mark Zona and Bill Dance, are they considered professional fishermen? Because if you have a million subscribers, but you kind of dabble in tournament, you still make a shit ton of money for the fishing industry. And that's what I think there's that weird ass gray area. Yeah, well, it's being a professional in the fishing industry. Mm. True. You know, you, you look at it that way. Um, but I think being a professional fisherman, if you're fishing competitively, professionally, garnering income. Okay. Okay. That to me, oh. that's just what that's what it means, you know. Whether it be sponsorship, even, dollar, you know. I don't even like fishing professionally. All I look at is: Are you fishing for a living? Are you making like a living? Guiding bass or, fishing. Like, if you make your our, living, our and mutual you provide, friend, our mutual friend Billy Colts. Yeah. Um, if he you fishes make for your living, living in, fishing, in part, I'll call you a professional. Yeah. I mean, I think guides like, yeah, you are paid to fish, sort of speak. So, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's so hard because like I kind of break it down in my mind, like baseball, because I was my background. Like you can be a professional coach, but you don't play anymore, but you're still in the profession versus if you are a pitcher for, you know, the Yankees. I mean, it's like the guy, uh, what's the Charlie, the best, was it Bass University? Oh, Bass University. That's oh shoot, Charlie. You talk about. Yeah, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, Charlie Ingram, professional fisherman, no doubt. Not competitively. Mm-hmm. He's the FLW tour. Well, yeah, but I'm just saying at this point. I seen his name the other day on a FLW All thing. Right. <laughs> All right, I got about 15 more, 20 more minutes. My girlfriend or daughter are downstairs, and I probably need to. Sounds good. Sounds good. We'll we'll be right right from this bad you, boy. You guys can keep going. I just need to get down. My girlfriend's down there too. I'm gonna be in God in trouble. No, she's too. not. She's right there. Oh, she's right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, we are having a very tangent filled <laughs> bass fishing conversation. <laughs> we really are. We really are. All right. You want to get some meat here, Thomas? Oh boy. Some meat and potatoes. Bill Potts, that to it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we got a couple more minutes. I just got rushed. Yeah, yeah let's, let's go, go for, for it. it. So, so honestly, honestly, like to, to, to really, really put, put a pin on the Phil Hey, come here, Barbara. <laughs> hey, there's Thomas right there. Thomas. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? Hey, guys. I'm trying to pick. I'm trying to make he's, your dad uh, famous. He's Pikachu. Hey, guys. Pikachu. Pikachu. <laughs> I'm Charmander. Hundred percent Charmander, all the way. All right, go tell mommy I'll be there in a few minutes, okay? <laughs> what is the best time to fish Phil Pot? Uh, March to... March to June. Uh, early yeah. June. Yeah, March to you. Yeah. So if people want to come down just to fish the place for fun, you think like March to June? Yeah, um, and that's not even factoring the spawn. Ooh, that's true. So that's like yeah, always the best place to go. I mean, it's it's fun during the spawn, but um, I mean, you don't have to sight fish to catch fish. Yeah, spring. spawn kind of sucks, man. Smallmouth spawn like 15, 20 foot deep. <laughs> yeah, that really does suck. Like you, you have to go scope them on bed. And trip jock right now. Scope them on bed, bro. Yeah, like, that would be, that's not fun though. It's boring. Like I like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna like spawn fish like that, I don't. I, I want to be up north where it's clear and I can watch them. Or if I can yeah. vlog them, I guess. But I don't know. That's just you can yeah. see them out to about ten foot, and after that, I mean, it, it is clear, but it's not that clear. Even at ten foot, you're chasing shadows. I mean, yeah, you can't. It ain't. You can't watch the bite. You know, you just kind of see a white spot, and that that's when it. we go target smallmouth. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I want to finish up with something you mentioned at the beginning, which is I need to know this Carolina rig fish story. And I think that's kind of the best way to sum this up, which is the seven, seven pounder you caught Carolina rig fishing. <laughs> oh yeah. So uh, I hooked him. He caught him. <laughs> oh, I, I, and we've got, we've got 15, 
20 minutes, 8 o'clock, 7.40. Yeah, yeah, we got time. Um, so Heiko Lake is down North Carolina, about 20 minutes from Danville. It's a power plant lake, so it's hot. Uh, but it's got a lot, being a power plant lake as well, it's got a lot of man-made structure. Canals, ditches, piles of shit. I don't know what's down there, but it's just. Plus docks. Docks. It's, it's, fairly, it's fairly shallow. It's kind of tannic uh, water. Bugs Island Water Clarity, Smith Mountain cover. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. But uh, so anyhow, it, it was mid-July or something. I hooked up with this bunch for a couple of weeks or months that did from. 5 a.m. to 11 during the summer. Yeah, something like that. 30 bucks, 40 bucks. So I took him down. He hadn't fished a tournament before, but I got the money on a bait caster. So I put a lightning rod combo in his hand with a rig and a Shakespeare reel. Shakespeare, yeah. And, yeah. and, a, and a, like a green pumpkin or a black lizard, one of the two. Just like go to town, cast it, drag it in. <laughs> I'm fishing one of the community holes. It's a it's the short canal going into South Heiko. And uh it's got a big pile of rubble at the mouth of it, and like it tops out in six or eight foot, but it dropped the creek channel goes around it. So I was dragging the creek channel. Uh I think I was throwing a big worm. But anyway, he's back there. <laughs> I'm home, Chase. I'm home. So I went and grabbed his rod. And I'm trying to bowstring, you know, because it felt like it was hung. Giant jumps out of the water, clean out of the water. And I was like, oh shit, this is a fish. Oh my God. <laughs> I said, oh, that's a fish. So he, he wanted the rod, he wanted the rod back, but being 10 or 11 years old, I'm like, I don't trust you with this. <laughs> <laughs> so his drag was all jacked up, and I'm I'm trying to get this fish in. I just told him, I'm like, you just get the net. It's your fish. You caught it, but let me just help you get it in the boat. And it well, it was a seven and a half, seven seven and a half. Yeah, big big one for the summertime. It was released alive, and uh, that was that's one of our best. That's one of my best memories. Mm -hmm. huh? Colin, how was your net job? I don't even remember, man. <laughs> it came in the boat. Yeah, I came in the boat. That's all that matters. I think I just kind of laid the net down, you know, and it come right up. I'm sure. I'm sure I steered her into it. <laughs> guys, I really appreciate you guys coming on tonight. Again, everyone, like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out with the algorithm. Link in the episode description. There, everything we talked about. Uh, like Chase, Colin. Is there anything else you want to promote, or anything we can link in the episode description? His socials. Yeah, yeah. Follow me on Instagram at Colin B Fishing, and uh, that's that's about it. I'm washed up. I don't, I don't have any. Don't say that. No, you, you, it, it, <laughs> no it's like it, it's like Rocky Two. You're gonna make a comeback. Yeah, we <laughs> no, we appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for having us yeah, on. Yeah, and, thank and you, man. The opportunity. I know we got off on a lot of other topics, but uh, that's the point, baby. That's why we're here. Yeah, it, it happens. Um, Come visit Philpot Lake. The Martinsville area is going to be your best place to stay if you decide to travel. Um, there's Hampton Inn. Um, the campgrounds on the lake are fabulous. However, they do have a season where they're open and closed. Like right now, they're closed. Um, but if anyone is interested in camping at Philpot, especially at Goose Point, um, get on check the, uh, the Corps of Engineers website to find out when they start accepting reservations because within a, a day or so, Goose Point will be booked for the year. Wow. Yeah, it, it's quick. Um, Salt House Branch Park is probably the next nicest yeah. place. Don't recommend Salt House Branch in the summer, though, because it uh, it's at the back end of a creek. I assume Salt House Branch. <laughs> and uh, it is shallow and mucky and bug filled and there's no air movement down there in the summertime. So goose points going to be the best bet for anyone wanting to camp or, or tent. They have uh, a lot of amenities. Yeah. 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 It's, it's the best setup. Horseshoe points. Nice as well, as well as uh, Jameson's meal, but goose points going to be your best one followed by salt house. And then like I said, the Martinsville area, Danville area is about 40 minutes down the road, plenty of uh, restaurants, stuff like that. For anyone coming 
um, to visit. And it, it's a gem of a of a lake, and we're proud to have it close by, and we're proud of the way the Corps has taken care of it for so long and kept the the development at bay because having that uh, – I know for me at least, I worked a really stressful job for a long time and going to fill pot and just being in nature with trees and water and rocks and dirt and fresh air was really good. So you, what about you? That's it. We covered it. <laughs> Guys, yeah, take, I mean, a spin, take a spinning rod. Honestly, that's all you need. <laughs> guys, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. And we'll definitely have you guys on again as, as things warm up as we get back into fishing season. Link in the episode description, everything we talked about. And then, guys, if you feel like it, try to join us on Patreon. We're only 44 members away from hitting our first goal where we're going to start pumping out three episodes per week the rest of the year. Check us out, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV. With your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.